Uh, we will have question and answer at the end of the uh, webinar as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. My name is Gina O'Brien. And as Julie said, I work for USDA Food and Nutrition Service. And we are one of seven regions out of, um, out of Denver here. We cover eight states and we have 30 sovereign nations in our region. I've been with FNS for about 25 years and have had the pleasure of working across all of our 15 food and nutrition assistance programs. And so with that, I'd like to just give a quick overview for anyone who is not um, familiar with our programs. And Andrea, thank you for driving. You can go to the next slide. Just a quick overview, USDA's Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Service. You may know that there are multiple agencies under USDA, and the Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Service is just one important USDA agency. We call it FNCS. It's made up of two core entities, FNS, whose mission is to increase food security and reduce hunger by providing children and low-income low income people access to food, a healthful diet, and nutrition education in a way that supports American agriculture and inspires public confidence. And then we also have the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion, or CNPP. They provide national leadership and technical expertise for the development of the dietary guidelines for Americans and the MyPlate consumer food guidance symbol. So the Food Nutrition Service, along with the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion, they are the agency of USDA working to increase access to healthy food for all Americans. And in partnership with the US Department of Health and Human Services, this group also researches the evidence behind the dietary guidelines that are the foundation of all of our nutrition assistance programs, as well as nutrition messaging and education. For example, messaging on planning healthy meals on a budget are always evidence-based as well um, and reflect the dietary guidelines. As you probably know, there are associations between food insecurity and poor health status. So those living in food insecure households consume fewer servings of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and more sugar, fat, and salt. These dietary shortfalls are linked to chronic diseases, including diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Next slide. USDA's Office of Tribal Relations has developed a website with resources across all of USDA agencies to help deal with COVID-19. And the Office of Tribal Relations has, it serves as a single point of contact and works to ensure that relevant programs are accessible and developed in consultation with American Indians and Alaska Native constituents. So from this website, um, just wanted you all to know about it. You can stay in the loop by signing up for an Office of Tribal Relations newsletter for updates. Next. Our 15 FNS programs cover the whole life cycle from birth through older adulthood, as well as various life stages and need in between. So these programs reach children, families, individuals of all cultures and communities, and they operate through public and private partnerships with state and local governments and nonprofit organizations to deliver all of our program benefits to the eligible participants. States, counties, cities, and school systems administer distribution of food benefits and determine eligibility for millions of children and families. There are thousands of local churches, food pantries, soup kitchens, and social service agencies that provide the direct nutrition assistance to hungry people with food and nutrition service support. So each of our programs, various meal patterns, food packages, and nutrition education and messages and materials are all science-based and they reflect the dietary guidelines for Americans. As you may know, those dietary guidelines are currently being updated for 2020 to 2025. They're updated about every five years. And so we'll have a link in the resources on where you can go to see more information about that. Next. And now I'd like to cover the resources that can be found on choosemyplate.gov. These resources are rich and vast, and they can be browsed or searched by audience, including children, adults, families, and professionals. 
The My Plate icon and Choose My Plate tip sheets are available in multiple languages. And as you probably know, this icon symbolizes the general recommendations or guidance for how we plan a balanced meal and how we, how we set up our plate. So in general, just remembering half your plates, fruits and vegetables. Um, when you're choosing your grains, make half of them whole grain to get that fiber and those extra vitamins. And then with protein, the goal is to choose lean proteins and a variety because protein um, food group. And then of course your calcium rich foods is represented by that dairy group there. Next. Also on this website, you can find a widget which helps you figure out exactly how many calories you need based on your um, age, your sex, your physical activity level. So anyone can use this. You can post this widget to your website, your blog, um, and then people can just enter in. And I wanted to highlight here that even pregnant or breastfeeding women can get information that's tailored by trimester. So this woman put in her age, um, her weight and height, and it told her exactly how many calories she needed and how that changed over the first, second, and third trimester. Next. On the website, you'll find um, information about a Start Simple campaign. This was launched just in 2019. It has lots of tips and ideas for creating a personalized plan to meet your food group targets. So once you know what your calorie level is, this helps you break down what does that mean in terms of number of servings from each of the food group targets. So you can find out what works for you and your family within your food preferences, your health goals, and your budget. Next. So I'm just going to um, highlight a couple of the groups since one of the biggest challenges is making half your plates fruits and vegetables for most people. And so this, uh, the fruit group, the big goal here is to focus on whole fruits and any fruit or 100% fruit juice counts. The recommended amount depends on uh, your age and your sex, but it ranges from one to two cups per day. Fruit is nutrient dense, it's high in fiber and potassium, and as part of an overall healthy diet, it may reduce risk for heart disease and protect against certain types of cancers. So a tip here is to eat what is in season. That fruit tends to be the most delicious and also priced right. Another tip is if you're craving something sweet, you can try dried fruits like cranberries, apricots, cherries, or raisins. And one thing to note here, when you're working toward that one to two cups um, per day goal, it only takes a half cup of dried fruit to be equivalent to a whole cup. And then one final tip is to keep fresh fruit ready to eat and where you can reach it when you need a snack. Next. With the vegetable group, the goal here is to vary your vegetables. Um, there are so many different wonderful textures and flavors and colors in this food group and every vegetable has a slightly different nutrient profile and really provides your body what it needs in terms of all those vitamins, minerals, and even trace minerals. So any vegetable or 100% vegetable juice count. The amount needed depends again on your age and sex, but it ranges from one to three cups total per day. The health benefits are similar to fruit. They're nutrient dense. They may reduce the risk of heart disease and protect against certain types of cancer. And they're loaded with fiber, potassium, and other vitamins and minerals. A tip is to try adding a new vegetable to a different meal each day. You can also add color to your salads with baby carrots, shredded red cabbage, or green beans, and include those seasonal veggies throughout the year. Uh, one thing to note here is that a cup of that green leafy salad vegetables is equivalent to just a half a cup when you're looking at reaching your goal for the day. And then one final tip is if you haven't tried hummus, it's delicious and you can eat that with raw broccoli, red and yellow peppers, sugar snap peas, celery, cherry tomatoes, or cauliflower. Next. Um, just a note here on eating what's in season. Most states have a statewide branding program for food that's grown or processed in their state, such as Sweet Grown Alabama or Colorado Proud. And these marketing programs are often run by the State Departments of Agriculture or Extension, and they have seasonality charts, farmer directories, and all kinds of free resources and materials. 
Um, so what we highlighted here was the seasonality chart from South Dakota State University Extension and um, highlights all the different vegetables available, fruits and vegetables available in that area. And if you wanted to know when is the best time to go get those wild choke cherries, it's in the fall. Next. USDA maintains a national nutrient database. This is a wealth of information and it's recently been rebranded to Food Data Central. And as we all know, food is a lot more than just calories. It needs to also feed our spirit and represent our culture. It's a really significant part of our everyday. And so it's, this is a great resource to go on to the website and find out what's in some of those favorite foods that you love. Um, how do you really kind of celebrate the nutrient profile of some of those traditional foods as well? You can find lamb's quarters in here, choke cherries, wild rose hips, stinging nettles, even cattail leaf shoots. Um, and so it might be helpful to know that prairie turnips are really rich in calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, an interesting story about lamb's quarters in terms of how Mother Earth feeds us. I've noticed that um, in downtown Denver, in the areas where uh, people who, persons who are homeless are often going to where th food is thrown away. I have seen more than once that a big wild um, grove of lamb's quarters, which is kind of like a wild spinach, is growing right where people are needing food. So kind of amazing what uh, nature provides. It also might be helpful to do a comparison. You can go to this website and compare spinach with lamb's quarters and find out that there's a very similar profile, but in fact, Lamb's Quarters has almost three times as much calcium as spinach and um, almost three times as much vitamin C. So it's an interesting and helpful resource. Next. So if you're wondering how to put all of this together, remember that Choose My Plate has print ready tip sheets that can be used in newsletters or as handouts or other educational settings. The topics cover each of the food groups, as well as meal planning, budget, shopping, food safety, even physical activity. So you can find tips for almost anything. My daughter is about ready to start college, and so I shared with her the mini fridge makeover tip sheet, and um, that was fun. There's also tip sheets on staying healthy on campus or choosing healthy foods in the cafeteria. There's healthy tips for vegetarian diets, snacking, redoing your coffee shop stop, and enjoying all kinds of different cuisine and navigating the buffet. Next. So there's no need to memorize all the nutrition recommendations and information and specifics on food groups. You can download the Start Simple with MyPlate app and you can plan your food group goals, you can get tips, and have all this Nutrition 101 information that I've been talking about right at your fingertips. Next. Wanted to highlight a little bit more about the Healthy Eating on a Budget section of Choose My Plate, because this section can help you plan weekly meals, make a grocery list, and save more when you're at the grocery store. There's information on smart shopping, understanding food price, and how to read the food label. And then there are kitchen time savers, tasty low cost recipes, and even a sample two weeks worth of menus. Next. Highlight here that Choose My Plate includes all of our links and to all of our information on food safety and educational materials. So anything you're looking for there, you can start with Choose My Plate and follow those links. Next. And Choose My Plate include, includes lots of good information on preventing wasted food. We can consider that about 90 billion pounds of edible food goes uneaten every year, making wasted food the single largest component going into our municipal landfills and costing most people almost $400 every year. You can learn more about what you can do to be mindful about planning, purchasing, protecting, preserving, storing, repurposing, donating, or recycling food to help save money and reduce the amount that gets thrown away. Next. 
the My Plate Kitchen page of Choose My Plate is where you can search recipes by ingredient, course, nutrient of focus, available cooking equipment, cuisine, or cost. This site allows you to save your favorite recipes and compile them into a downloadable cookbook. And there are also a number of easy to follow um, video videos for recipes. There are traditional recipes on this site or recipes made with traditional foods, such as blue corn pan bread or cranberry wujapi. Next. So while we're all at home, I just wanted to finally highlight a few of USDA's online resources for kids. These free games and videos and interactive early readers are really fun for kids and also help them learn about healthy eating. The interactive Discover My Plate Early Reader series is available on EPUB and iTunes. Next. There's a blast off game which helps train young astronauts how to fuel up with physical activity, healthy foods and balanced meals so that they have the energy they need to blast off and complete a mission. Next. And the Team Nutrition Cooks materials include family handouts combined with cooking skills videos that are really kid friendly and fun to watch. And all of these resources that I've talked about are listed in the resource handout that we'll provide today. So feel free to put any questions in the chat box for our Q&A that we're doing later. But now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Kathy Young. Hi everyone. Um, I'm the new Tribal Affairs Specialist in the Mountain Plains Regional Office, and I've been with FNS since 2008. And during that time, I worked with um, in the SNAP and WIC programs. The Tribal Affairs Specialist is a new position in our region, and we're working to develop what my full duties will consist of. But my primary responsibilities will be to provide to regional office staff and our, um, our work with our tribal partners um, some assistance and, um, and any help address any issues there are in um, our work with the tribes. Um, currently, we're in the process of assessing how my position can serve our, our internal needs and over the next year we'll work to identify any ex the external needs of our tribal partners and how we can reduce the burdens of tribes ac accessing our FNS nutrition programs. Uh, I look forward to hopefully working with um, many of you or those within your agencies in the in the coming years. Next slide. Uh, now that you know a little bit about me, my part in this presentation today is to show you a USDA launched application called Mills for Kids Site Finder. USDA launched this online tool in April to help families find meals for their children while schools are closed during the coronavirus pandemic. The Meals for Kids Site Finder is available for use at no charge, and it is a web-based application, but it also works on tablets, smartphones, and other mobile devices um, without the need to download it. And the interactive map directs people to local sites where kids can get free meals. The site finder currently lists more than 20,000 meal sites from 23 states and more sites are being added as states submit data each week and the map is av available in both English and Spanish and it can be located at fns.usda.gov slash meals the number four kids. As of June 4th, 44 states and Puerto Rico have provided information for the interactive map. When you get to the, when you go into the website, um, you get this image that pops up and um, 
as it says, you just click on that image to enter it. Um, next slide, please. So when you, when you click on an image, it brings up an image of the United States. And in the Find Meals for Kids section there on the right-hand side, you just enter your search criteria. Um, so you can find, you can enter an address, a physical address. You can enter a city in town, or you can enter a state. And um, next slide, please. It, it, when you do that, it brings this view. And everywhere there is a blue dot is a school feeding site. Um, so there, here we have, I um, typed in Fort Yates, North Dakota, and um, up pop two um, blue dots in that location. And when you, you click on the blue dot, and it, um, it provides you the, the name and address of uh, one of the feeding sites, and it'll give you the, um the times and what meals are being served at that location and um also if you notice on the right hand side um under the, where it says um summer meal sites um it'll give you the site and um the distance from the location that you you've typed in so if you type in your um, a home address, it would give you the distance from your the home address to the, the feeding site. Next, please. USDA also makes the data available to developers to incorporate into other applications. And for example, the Food Finder and NutriSlice um, have both developed innovative solutions to increase nationwide access to free meals. The Food Finder will display USDA's Meals for Kids locations on their web and mobile app. And NutriSlice offers their mobile ordering and meal locator solutions for free um, to hundreds of schools nationwide. So when you go into the Food Finder app, this is what you see. And um, as with the USDA Meal Finder app, you simply enter the zip code you're looking for, and it populates the locations where food assistance is being provided. And then if you click on the red location markers, it gives you the name of the site and more details of the dates, time, and location of food pickups and availability. Next slide, please. For the NutriSlice app, you go into their website at NutriSlice.com. And on the home page, you'll see this highlighted, this um, section that I have highlighted in, in um, pink here. And it says, um, their NutriSlice is giving schools the tech they need to get meals to kids. Um, and it's free. It, when you click on learn more, it takes you to a page that describes what this app can do to help schools connect students and their families to access school meals being provided during the closures. This is a service that NutriSlice stood up in response to the pandemic and school closures um, to help support contingency feeding at no cost until the start of the next school year. So the uh, 2021 school year. Schools do have to sign up for this app for it to be available, but you can go in and um, see a demo of the app through a demo link in their homepage. You, you see that down below here. Um, this, this 
um, pre-program is, is good for any school or district needing an easy way to communicate to families and um, where they can get meals during school closures. And um, whether or not an, a, an existing Nutrislice customer, you're a customer or not, they're looking to closely work with every school to get uh, meal programs operating. And um, in most circumstances, they're doing it in less than a day. So um, if it's not currently available in your school district, you can um, contact the school district and, and your local school and, and talk to them about it. Next slide, please. Um, yep, and that that's covers what I have to uh, talk to you about, and I'll turn it over to Andrea Alma now. Thank you, Kathy. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Andrea, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about farm to school. And I know that might sound a little weird because in a lot of cases, schools out for the summer or um, not looking the same as it has, but um, you know, I'm, I'm here to kind of talk about, about local food and fresh food from farms and how we can access, the, access that during COVID-19 and, and beyond, um, specifically for children. Um, so what, what is farm to school? Um, one of the ways that we like to define it is by uh, using what we call the three C's. So um, incorporating local and fresh foods into uh, school meals in the cafeteria, uh, using local food as a, an educational tool in the classroom, and, and engaging community members um, around fresh local food. So, so that's, that's, what, uh, that's what those three C's refer to. And uh, school gardens kind of fit right in the middle of those three C's because they can certainly provide fresh food to the cafeteria. Uh, gardens, as we know, can be classrooms in themselves and uh, community members sure do tend to get involved in in gardens in, in you know whether they're at schools or at your neighbor's house or in your community. So our farm to school team um, has kind of three main areas where we support communities around farm to school. One is uh, with our farm to school grants. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of those grants and what they look like in Indian country. Uh, we provide some training and technical assistance to schools and communities. And uh, we do our best to conduct some research and make sure we're understanding what the best practices are um, around the country when it comes to farm to school. So the way our office is situated is that there are seven regions and the areas covered by the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board uh, span across our Mountain Plains region, where I, Andrea, am the Farm to School Regional Lead, and, and Iowa, actually, where my colleague Jenna Siegel is the Farm to School Regional Lead. And we're, we're your go-to um, and can help connect you with, uh, with resources and grants and, and assistance if your community is looking to start or expand farm to school efforts. So let me talk a little bit about our farm to school grants. Um, these grants started in about 2013. Uh, we give out between five and $10 million a year across the country to schools, to uh, nonprofit organizations, to Indian tribal organizations, and other entities, farmers, um, to expand access to local foods, basically make, make those three C's happen uh, in your community. And I did wanna mention these grants, especially because um, during this time of COVID-19, we are working with our grantees uh, in Indian country and, and, and around the country uh, to adapt and address the needs and, um, and kind of pivot in order to serve, serve communities uh, 
you know, in these times we're in. So I did want to mention that. Um, and these grants will open up for folks to apply to in September. So uh, keep an eye out for those. I'll show you how to get signed up for a newsletter in case you're interested in those, those grants. So I wanted to highlight a couple of uh, grantees and past grantees that have really focused on traditional foods and um, you know, weaving in um, some of basically grants that are taking place in Indian country serving Native Americans. So um, this is Cherokee Central High School uh, in North Carolina, and they use their grant to form a really neat partnership between their school nutrition program and their culinary arts uh, high school students. So they did a lot of taste testing and recipe development around traditional foods that were then incorporated into the school meals. Um, so here's a picture of a couple of those students doing a taste test. They also did a lot of work around um, their school gardens and using those school gardens as forums for teaching traditional um, languages, as you can see in this picture. Um, and, and this is actually some signage uh, in the cafeteria as well. So they use this grant to make some of that um, signage and communication. Um, these are some pictures from the Star School and the Navajo Nation, and um, they uh, use their farm to school grant to develop some partnerships with a, a native run local farm, uh, North Loop Family Farm. And you can see some of the community members visiting the farm here, and the farm um, uses, you know, traditional dry land. Um, practices to grow products for the school meal program. Um, but then there's also a really strong education and community engagement uh, element of the Star School's work where you can see their, uh, it looks like they're, uh, they're, they're, they're pulling out some um, traditional blue cornbread. Um, and they created a really great toolkit if in case you're interested, um, you can find it on the Star School website. So again, another example of a grantee. And a prior grantee was the Intertribal Buffalo Council. So um, they did some work around training school nutrition professionals to incorporate buffalo into uh, school meals and also brought in ranchers to talk about how, um, how, how bison are raised and, and, um, and, and did some taste testing with students as well. So, kind of weaving those three C's around, around the buffalo and the traditional importance of, of the buffalo. So those were a couple of examples of our farm to school grants in Indian country, but I wanted to share a picture of this fact sheet. Um, and again, we'll share all of these links in the resource uh, page that we'll, we'll, we'll send out to you all. Um, but, uh, Across USDA, you know, there are a lot of uh, funding opportunities for local food efforts, and and this is a this is a um, fact sheet that shows how different agencies actually can contribute to farm to school efforts or other local food system efforts. And so, this is a good one if you're looking for some funding resources um, for your community. All right, it's the next slide. When it comes to training and technical assistance, uh, our office does have all sorts of fact sheets. Um, and I highlighted here on the bottom of the slide two of the fact sheets that I think might be, um, you know, most relevant to you all. Um, there's one around bringing tribal and traditional foods into cafeterias and classrooms and, and school gardens. Uh, and then there's another one specifically about gardens or school gardens in tribal communities. So um, these are two fact sheets that dispel some myths, I think, around the use of traditional foods in school meals and also um, give you some ideas and share some examples about successful garden projects. So you can find those on our website. If you want to stay in the loop on uh, some of these resources and grant opportunities, uh, don't hesitate to sign up for our newsletter. It's called The Dirt, and you will join a, a crew of folks nationwide who are getting kind of the latest information from our team about best practices, research, grants, and, and assistance for you. 
So USDA, of course, doesn't do doesn't do all the work when it comes to farm to school. I wanted to highlight two um, really great examples of toolkits around um, farm to school in native communities that were developed by native communities. Uh, one is the Native Farm to School Research Resource Guide by First Nations Development Institute. I know they're going to be working on even some more uh, farm to school materials because they have a, another grant from our office to do that. And, um, and this American Indian Traditional Foods in USDA School Meal Programs Guide. Uh, it's based out of Wisconsin, but has some great uh, resources that would be relevant to, to a lot of different Native communities. Um, so definitely those are two to check out. And again, we link to both of those in the resource guide that we'll be sharing. When it comes specifically to farm to school in the time of COVID-19, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of different trends around the country. However, in, in rural areas, uh, one of the things that I have heard in particular is that sometimes uh, we're, we're seeing some shortages of, of food when it comes to um, big box delivery trucks. And uh, the local food supply chain actually might be now more important and more resilient than ever. Um, and so uh, th this website here is from the National Farm to School Network, which is a nonprofit partner to USDA around farm to school efforts. And they have some really great resources about how to, how to build up that local food system and where to access local foods. And um, especially if you're looking to feed children and families and um, they've got also some really great online uh, gardening resources linked up here as well. But I highlighted for you with the little blue arrow there, um, they do have a list of resources specifically for native and tribal communities. So definitely something to check out um, if you're looking for some time sensitive farm to school or local food and COVID-19 resources. First Nations Development Institute has also, I know, been doing a lot around um, uh, addressing immediate needs uh, around hunger and COVID-19. And so I did want to highlight this. They are one of our current grantees um, and they're doing some really great work to share funding opportunities. So they've got like an updated funding opportunities list. They, uh, they also have an emergency response fund of their own that you may apply to. Um, and, and on their website, just kind of have a, a number of resources that, that um, if you haven't checked out, you might find that helpful. And the last program I wanted to mention was um, the US, so USDA is rolling out some assistance directly to farmers. And uh, that, that's sort of taking two major forms, one being uh, some direct assistance payments to farmers. And if that's something you're interested in, you can definitely reach out. Um, but the one that I wanted to share a little bit more about is the Farmers to Families Food Box Program. And this is where USDA is purchasing food from, or let me say it another way, USDA is paying for basically uh, contracted vendors to distribute boxes of food um, to, to families in need. And so a lot of these food boxes uh, are going out largely through partner organizations. So uh, food banks and food pantries, even schools. Um, and I know that uh, these boxes are making their way in some cases to Indian country. And if you are not seeing them make their way to your community, um, what I would recommend is, uh, again, I shared this link in the resource page, but for, our, for the region you're in, you can find a list of the different vendors who are distributing these boxes. And um, what USDA is, is encouraging is that you give a call to those vendors um, and or I would give, also give a call to perhaps the major food bank in your area because um, I'm pretty sure, in, well, I know that in North South Dakota, uh, Montana, Wyoming, and Nebraska, at least, um, these boxes are making their way largely to Indian country through food banks. Um, so uh, definitely check out this, this website if you're interested in more about these food boxes. 
And uh, I'm about to pass it over to uh, April here, but just a reminder to type in the, the chat box if you've got any questions or write them down so you can ask us in a few minutes here when we do Q&A and, and thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Uh, great presentation. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is April Lipinski. I am the Mass Care Specialist for FEMA Region 8 out of Denver, Colorado, and I do appreciate this opportunity uh, to talk to you all today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, my job. So Mass Care essentially not only supports emergency feeding efforts, but also um, sheltering, evacuation, reunification, uh, pets. So if you have service animals or just um, you know dogs and cats, uh, that comes into play a lot when folks are evacuating and, and hesitate to evacuate because they can't bring their pets with them. We also um, support a lot of access and functional needs. So people with disabilities, uh, we like to focus a lot of attention on that and, and ensure that they're uh, prioritized uh, during times of disaster. So um, another thing that we do when we're not involved in all of these disasters and emergencies all the time are to support communities such as tribal nations uh, with feeding and sheltering planning. So if uh, after my presentation today, if you all are interested uh, in reaching out to me uh, for any questions, but also if you're interested in uh, getting some uh, support with feeding and sheltering and developing plans uh, in conjunction with your emergency manager, I would be happy to um, assist with that or answer any questions. So let me know. Um, I think we can go ahead and go on to the next slide. All right, so I do apologize because my slides are not as beautiful as my USDA counterpart. So uh, next time I come on to this call, if I'm invited again, I'll make sure that I have some nice pictures in here. Uh, so FEMA, as you probably all know, uh, really supports disasters, primarily um, natural disasters. So hurricanes, tornadoes, that sort of thing. Um, definitely we've been pulled into COVID-19 um, a little bit more than originally we thought. So we are considered the lead agency um, in coordination with uh, Health and Human Services to respond to this event. Uh, so as part of that, um, we are supporting any kind of feeding needs. And uh, what we're seeing a lot recently, especially amongst our more rural areas, as Andrea was talking about, and some of our more vulnerable populations, is just um, a drastic increase in need uh, for food. So a lot of that is coming you know, from this high demand on uh, food banks. So as part of that, FEMA has um, sort of partnered with our public assistance branch to offer um, a little bit more than what we normally do which is a reimbursement program to governments. And this includes tribal governments. So normally, as you can see on this slide, uh, what FEMA kind of provides is these meals ready to eat. And I don't know if you all know about this, but these shelf stable meals are not very healthy or nutritious. It's just a mechanism to essentially insert calories uh, into an individual to ensure you know, they make it through. So this is not a healthy choice. Um, however, it is a necessity in some circumstances, especially when governments are preparing for uh, large catastrophic events. And so FEMA is used to kind of, you know, fulfilling these sorts of orders. Um, this is not an ideal option. So what's great about what we're doing for COVID-19 now is um, if your government, including your tribal government, finds a need uh, for food procurement and distribution beyond what normally happens. Um, you could set up an agreement, um, you know, with a business that you contract with normally, uh, maybe like Cisco or some of these other uh, large um, companies that provide uh, foodstuffs. And you can procure food and then partner with maybe nonprofits to distribute it. And it doesn't necessarily need to work in that order. But if you, if you were all seeing a need for this um, sort of support, um, it is possible under the public assistance policy that came out, which is included in your resource um, 
page that will be sent out after this. This policy essentially ensures that the government can be reimbursed for this additional cost of food procurement and distribution. So it's been pretty interesting um, to see some of the stuff that's come out across the nation and how clever um, states and even county governments have um, been taking advantage of this. Uh, a lot of feeding that is happening, we are not necessarily aware of. So as more information comes, we'll kind of uh, see you know, how, how different governments work this. But for instance, I can tell you uh, here in Colorado, uh, they're not only just procuring additional food and sending it out to the food banks, more like shelf stable items like you know, peanut butter and cereal and that sort of stuff. But they're also wanting to partner with local restaurants who would um, create frozen meals that will then be distributed through food banks as well. So all of that is a reimbursable cost and essentially um, a really great way to support more healthy sorts of feeding. Um, so if you have any questions about that specific program, you, know, you can feel free once again to reach out to me and I can put you in contact with some of our partners um, who deal directly with kind of the policy and reimbursement side. Um, my, my purpose is to help kind of plan for these sorts of uh, feeding missions. So one thing I do want to mention with regard to uh, this reimbursement is that there is a cost share for the tribe. It is 25% um, if the tribe is uh, seeking, um, you know, direct assistance through FEMA. Otherwise, if uh, they're a subrecipient through the state, uh, the cost share is 15% for the tribe. So it can be a little bit uh, confusing and bogged down again, once again, with policy, but but there is an avenue for reimbursement there and a lot of people are taking advantage of that. Finally, before we move on to my last slide, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the other work uh, we do with collaborating with voluntary agencies. Uh, sometimes we get a lot of questions um, and requests for other sorts of commodities like uh, diapers or baby formula, that sort of thing. Uh, we have a good relationship with our voluntary agencies all across the region and really throughout the country. And uh, because we're uh, super involved in uh, all of these voluntary agencies, when we get a request that FEMA can't necessarily meet, uh, we do reach out and send that request to the voluntary agencies to um, fulfill uh, that, that request. So that's been uh, a really great kind of sequence of delivery for us. And so it's, you know, whenever there's a question about, you know, assistance specifically with regard to feeding, distribution of supplies, um, or sheltering, uh, FEMA is always a good place to kind of stop and ask, because even if we can't fulfill um, that request, we probably know the folks who can. Next slide, please. Okay. So uh, one question that we got in the beginning of COVID-19 was whether or not um, processing of livestock would be part of that reimbursable expense uh, with regard to that, uh, that uh, food reimbursement. So uh, luckily we did reach out to our headquarters folks and they, they, they looked at it because they hadn't thought about it before and they did say that it, it is a reimbursable expense um, if it meets these uh, specific uh, qualifications. So. Um, you know, re reduce mobility of people, uh, an increase or atypical demand for feeding, and just the general disruption of the food supply chain. So um, that, that was a huge win, I think, and I know a lot of our uh, tribal nations in the Dakotas are kind of taking advantage of this. So I could probably talk a lot more, but I want to make sure that we have time for questions. So if you all have um, any specific questions related to this, feel free to email me or give me a call. Thanks so much. All right, Julie here with uh, Good Health and Wellness Program. Um, if there are questions, you can go ahead and verbally do that or you could put it in the chat box, either works. Thank you, by the way, for all of our presenters. All of that information was very helpful. I took good notes, but we will get that uh, the slides out to all of you along with the resource sheet that they referred to.
So if anybody is really quick and wants to fill out the evaluation, um, the link is in the chat box. Um, I'm not hearing anything. Maybe it was so good we don't have questions. So Ray gave a comment with Cheyenne River um, Chunley, Co Chunley Coalition. Great resources. Thanks for sharing. Julie, this is Joe Coulter. Uh, Hi. Uh, I've uh, worked with the Meskwaki tribe here in Iowa, uh, and I'm in public health. Uh, and uh, to uh, expand their greenhouse and their gardens and so forth. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, USDA and, and FEMA could uh, put out some resources that would help uh, tribal nations develop their own agriculture. Uh, the uh, Meskwaki have had very good luck in um, producing good uh, fruits and vegetables and providing a, a box uh, for all of seasonal stuff um, in season. Uh, they also uh, provide uh, uh, food for the uh, cafeteria and then they go and sell at the farmers markets and actually make money. Uh, and I think it would be, you know, this is something that you don't do overnight, uh, but is a long term kind of thing. And that I'm working with some uh, tribal communities up in Montana uh, through a big grant system to, to get into their, you know, into the tribal garden. It's not community gardens, it's, a, it's, the, it's the tribe runs it and employs people uh, and makes it a business. Well, thank you, Joe, for sharing all of that. I think that's probably something that I'll let the presenters uh, speak to if they have something, but excellent points, by the way. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Joe. Um, I know I've definitely watched some of the kept an eye on some of the Meskwaki food sovereignty uh, work and it's very, very impressive. Um, I'd be more than happy to perhaps help talk with with anyone uh, about what USDA grants might be the most, uh, the best fit for a project that they have in mind, whether that's a USDA farm to school grant. I'm also, as you just were talking, I was thinking maybe a um, community food project grant, which is another grant through one of our sister agencies. So um, yeah, more, th more than happy to do some brainstorming uh, with, with folks to see what, what resources would be the best option. Yes, I mean, um, I helped them uh, financially uh, with their computer system so that they could keep track of uh, of things, but you know, there's a lot of infrastructure that goes along with, with this. Uh, they've got to get the land in shape. Uh, and by the way, the Meskwaki Gardens is all organic uh, and organic certified. But uh, you know, you're going to do it in the right way. You've got to build a greenhouse and uh, you know, get the the farming equipment and you know hire people to, to, to do it and it's a major thing, but it's, it's, it really works pretty good. And that First Nations, uh, they give grants uh, for that, uh, for that very thing, but, you know, they're kind of modest. Yeah. Grants are usually modest, aren't they? No. <laughs> um, thanks, Joe, for sharing all of that. That's I'm glad to have you on here. Um, 
I did have a question come, or a, yeah, it is a question from Courtney Davis, um, and I'll repeat it so people that might be on a phone can hear it. Um, agreed, great resources. Are there any initiatives to have some of the fact sheets in tribal languages in addition to English and Spanish? Um, I, this is Gina, and I know that they're going to be developing new consumer messages once the 2020 dietary guidelines are out. And, um, and so at that point, they're going to be looking at needs for translating materials. If there is a specific um, language, tribal language, that would be, I guess, top on the request or um, persons who would be able to help with that translation, um, please do send that to us and we can forward that up to our national office. I would love to see that happen as well. Thank you, Gina. Um, I, I did wanna just add on to that. Um, great question, Courtney. I, I know that there are uh, there's a need out there for that, and there are so many tribal languages and dialects, and many of our farm to school grantees um, are actually doing some of that. So if you're interested in the farm to school space, and you and again have a particular language, I'd be happy to connect you. You know, we had a grantee on the Wind River Reservation that did a lot of translation um, there, and and um, you know, de depending on where you are and, and which languages you're thinking and, and what topic areas you're thinking um, might be able to help as well. But great, thank you for the question. Courtney says, thanks for the response. Do I have other comments or questions before we say thank you and um, log off? All right, so as promised, um, we'll get you um, an email with the resource sheet, the slides, and a SurveyMonkey link as well. It's also in the chat box, but I just want to say thank you to Andrea, Kathy, Gina, and April um, for kind of pulling all that together, a lot of information that was really helpful. Um, I think for the people on the call, and thank you all of you who joined us. Um, we appreciate you as well.